Hey everybody, how's it going? Dan Schinder here live on Drum Talk TV coming to you from beautiful Globe, Arizona, a hundred miles east of Phoenix in the mountains. I'm thrilled to have back on the show Roger Earl, founding member and drummer of Fog Hat, coming to us from Long Island Ice Tea. Er, I mean Long Island, New York. Uh, <laughs> Roger, how are you? You look great. I uh life has been very kind to me. I'm not entirely sure why but it has uh, no, no, i think it's great it's i back think, on the road yeah it's all about i think because you've had the greatest intentions and those intentions come around and these have, intentions now have gone on for 50 years my first question is when you yeah. guys first got back together back when fred flintstone lived on one side of you <laughs> and barney rubble on the other what, what were your thoughts about okay the first album's coming out wow, it'd be great if we could hang on and put out maybe one or two more. Uh, like if someone said to you, do you think you could hang in there and do this for 50 years? What kind of nonsense would that have sounded like? Or was that your vision to just do this until you were a senior and beyond? Uh, um, musicians are inherently selfish, or certainly most of the most successful ones. Well, the guitar players anyways. Uh, yeah, well, uh, drummers aren't a lot better uh, because I, I, I first started to, uh, playing, uh, I took lessons when I was 12 or 13. I would get into that. But like, and I, I, I was a commercial artist between well, when I left school at 15 until I was 20, 21. So, you know, I had to have a job to pay for the uh, drums, drums and cymbals, very expensive. Yeah, uh, that I'm hasn't changed. Stories about yeah, right. <laughs> um, but um, it's all I ever wanted to do. I had to have a day job to pay for them. Um, everything came in second to playing playing drums and auditioning and playing. Uh, and my first wife said I was I was the rotter, and, and, and I, I admit that. I said I was. We well, shouldn't have married me. I was a much better boyfriend. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> my second wife probably, uh, well, she shouldn't have married me either because I was a much better. Uh, I was always leaving. I was always on the road. Uh, like, so you were a friend. better drummer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> than a husband. <laughs> that's what I wanted to do. Yeah. I mean, get me wrong. I, I, you know, I love my family. I love my children. Love my brothers and sisters, and I'm very close to all my bandmates. But the only thing I wanted to do was play. You know, it's like it, that's the, the only thing you you want to do. It's like, and uh, when I first started, it was like I go to all sorts of auditions. I'm like 16 years old and auditioning all over London and stuff. I'd only been playing for about three years, but. I wanted to play and I did anything and everything I could to play. Everything else took second place to it. <laughs> so what would 50 years have sounded like back then? Oh, uh, um, and that's just one band. I, I, Obviously you were playing before that, but just when fog hat got its deal, um, could you, yeah, how far it, did you look into the future? Wednesday? <laughs> I, I didn't. I didn't. It would, it would. You take it one day at a time. Yeah. You know, one song at a time, one album at a time. Um, uh, when we got our deal with Bearsville Records through uh, Albert Grossman, uh, who was the manager of Peter Paul and Mary, the band Bob Dylan, uh, Janis Joplin, and so we knew it was a big noise if we got it, uh, and we did. In fact, when Albert came over to see us, he saw us in a little club in North London. But it was like, uh, no, just, just. Day to day, song by song, record by record, gig by gig. I don't think I ever looked at any further than like the next morning. Really, it was um, still don't. It's uh, now we we talk about like now we talk about maybe do it. We're doing a record like the end of the year. We've already started. We've already got like seven or eight sort of basic ideas laid down. We've got a studio down in Florida. Yeah, but um, fifty years. I don't know. I'm going to roll till I'm old and rock till I drop. I don't feel very well. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And folks, chime in in the comments. You could ask some questions. I'll relay some questions. You see, there's a couple comments. One already from an awesome drummer, A.D. Adams, who lives in Phoenix, Arizona, who's the drummer for the amazing band Louis Prima Jr. 
and the witnesses. Okay. I don't think they've kicked no. you out anyways, AD, have they? <laughs> Ingo Marte, an wait, awesome wait, drum wait, Texas. Wait. Hello, Jen. What's that, Roger? Louis Prima, always had great drummers. Oh, yeah. Bobby Morris and, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, they were always great. They yeah. were really fast. Yeah, <laughs> that fast yeah. shuffle. Ingo yeah, says right. uh, he loved working with you and the Fog Hack uh, course. Um, Ingo Marte, a, a wonderful guy who's an awesome yeah. drum tech. And, and speaking of drum techs, if I remember correctly, a little birdie told me that your drum tech helped sort of light the fuse on what became a brand new custom snare drum for you from oh. DW, correct? Yeah, you want to see a picture? I do. And I, you know what? I have a picture too. I'll pull up a picture on the screen. But yeah, if you have something handy, that'd be great. <laughs> ah, there. It is. That's a good picture. Let's see it. Uh, uh, yeah, Mark Petricelli was my drum tech, and yeah. uh, this surprise. I didn't even know it was go it was happening. This uh, thirteen by uh, six and a half. Um, what is it? It's uh, and it's a fiftieth anniversary. Uh, yeah. Is it Gold maple hardware. or birch? Ma maple. It's beautiful. It is. There's it is, it is the, it is the inside. DW drums. Yeah. Beautiful. I've been a DW endorser since, I can't remember, seems like forever. Yeah. The best, the best people there, really fabulous people. And, like, you know, sometimes when I'm on the road, something goes wrong uh, or – we lose something or if I need to get hold of a drum kit, because we do most of our days of fly-ins. Uh, DW have been terrific. Hold on. That's good. When I, when I got the drum around that time, I got this as well. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> Sal Rodriguez, you know Sal Rodriguez? He's the percussionist with Paul. Yeah. yeah. He, he made this for me and said, there you go. That's Actually, perfect. We, That's we beautiful. Had, make noise together. Yeah, he's also an artist as well as a great drummer. That's awesome. Going back to Foghead history, Roger, what was the first like big pivotal point? Was it the first live Foghead album or was it the studio album that came out right before that, that the tour was all about? Or was it something that happened even before then that was like, like, okay, we really got to keep this together because this is on a rocket. Um, it was actually, uh, we were right, uh, we were down to our last literally pennies and shillings before Albert Grossman came over. We'd left, we'd left Savoy Brown for about a year and a half and we were putting the band together. We were rehearsing and uh, the greenies were actually getting really, really low. I, um, in fact, I was actually starting to look to maybe get a day job. Mm. Ah, that horrible <laughs> but, uh albert grossman came over uh, the record uh was the thing that saved us and gave us um yeah it gave us uh a real focus we've been rehearsing and writing for like a year in various um rehearsal places out in uh, we were living out in uh, oxfordshire near wallingford and um it was um, it was really getting tough. We couldn't play in England because our previous manager uh, stopped us. He back, actually blackballed us from working in England and all the states. Um, I, I'm not exactly sure why, because I stayed really good friends with Kim Simmons, the guitar player in Savoy Brown, but the manager decided that we couldn't work there. In fact, I remember talking to the... Uh, agency chrysalis uh, uh chris ls and terry wright mm -hmm. <laughs> i went over to their house and they said look we can't book you harry simmons has said that he would he would take two bands away from us if we would give you any dates um wow that made it tough yeah he was a real scumbag he's not with us anymore so that's all right yeah <laughs> <laughs> all is forgiven uh it, it, you know what it, it's unnecessary that it's like um, I remember one time, um, you know, there's 
most bands get on really well and, and I think there's a great kinship amongst musicians, especially drummers. You know, we're, uh, we're a happy bunch because we get to bash stuff, uh, kick stuff and crash stuff. Yeah, well, I love my job. I, you know, I get, get it out of our system. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's... Um, it, I, I don't understand why, why people do stuff like that because it's unnecessary. You know, um, yeah. the, uh, you know, you, you, you can't use the PA the same as ours because you're, what well, it's like. It's insecurity, I think. Yeah, yeah, but why be insecure? I mean, it's all about music. It's all about yeah. playing. It's all about having fun. Um, and you, music is the great, uh, I don't know, unifier as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. You know, people, that's why people go to shows. That's why people listen to music because it makes them happy. Mm -hmm. uh, give joy. So uh, uh, that's how I feel about that sort of thing. And I've tried to adhere to that throughout my career. And any bands that open up for us, I give them, they get, they get to use whatever they need. It's none of this. So you can't use the lights. You can't use the PA. Right. Just don't, just don't break anything. Right? <laughs> yeah. that, that youthful enthusiasm that some of them have. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Let's talk about this. I'm going to show a, a picture um, to everybody. These wonderful new gold and blue colored 50th anniversary vinyls with the, the again, the prehistoric, prehistoric fog hat logo on the album cover and the picture of you guys. Talk about these. And we've got the link to where people can buy them in the description. And I understand you have some autograph copies as well. Yeah. Uh yeah there we go it's a blue vinyl uh, yeah. uh, beautiful vinyl. um actually this is it's a it's a fantastic record i mean even this day when i when you listen to it and i'm real proud of it you know uh, at the time i was really excited actually when we first started recording it in in wales uh, Rockfield Studios. Um, we were kind of struggling with, because um, uh, we weren't really producers, we were musicians and we knew what we liked, but like getting it out, <coughs> you know, onto the tape. And Dave Edmonds was working the night shift and we were working the day shift. And uh, as would, as it would be, we would, they would cross over from time to time <coughs> and we'd get to listen to some of Dave Edmonds stuff. And we go, wow. We've got a long way to go. <laughs> <laughs> it's a learning process, being able to be exposed to his stuff, right? Yeah. Um, and so uh, I believe it was our manager. We, The band talked about it. We said, you know, we, we need a helping hand here. And uh, <clears throat> so could, can you ask Dave Edmonds if you will produce our record for us? Um, and he said, well, um, I'm a bit busy at the moment, boy, but um, as soon as I'm finished with this record, yeah. Because he, he really liked what he, he was hearing and uh, really beautiful guy, a great talent as well. Um, I, think I, I think I got off course there a little bit. What was that? What were we talking about? Ah, the the vinyl, colored vinyl in that first album. So, yeah, right. you're on track. All right. And the, and the gold one as well. I don't have the gold one here, but yeah. And I, I wrote a little blurb on the back. Um, I, there's a now story from this one about. Oh, that's great played on what because they they thanked everybody that played on it like my brother dave edmonds um todd rungren john williams played bass andy wearfeather low played on it oh wow uh, yeah um they all gave us a helping hand uh um it was actually it was a lot of fun making the record um but i also know that without dave edmonds input it wouldn't wouldn't have been anywhere near as successful as it was without Dave's, um, you know, a producer basically I think is like, as with us, is the fifth member of the band. When they join the band, they're in the band and hopefully they know how to play everything. But it's funny. I thought you were going to say akin to a babysitter. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, we don't need babysitting. And, and, I, and I say that about every, every member and we've had, <laughs> people in this band everybody took it when we go in the studio it's like 
down to business. And especially the drummer. I mean, like, if, if we don't get it right, um, everything sucks without yeah. us. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the producer is the fifth member if it's a four person band for sure. Yeah. Uh, and I, 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 I was real fortunate. I got to work with some great producers over the years, especially Nick Jameson, mm. uh, Dave Edmonds, uh, Tom Dawes, uh, a number of great players. So, uh, yeah, it's um, being in the studio. I mean, you know, you have to think about what you're doing. It's concentration. Hopefully, your chops are up to it. But um, uh, it, it's a, actually, I'm a little bit more, um, what's the word? Relaxed, I think, now. When I, first, I, you know, first time I was in the studio, it was like, um, it's nerve wracking because I've never really been in the studio before when I was, what, uh, 20 years old, first time I joined Savoy Brown. Yeah. But now it's a bit, well, we have our own studio down in Florida, in the land, and you know, there's no red light. Um, we all play, we sit up in the living room, and Brian Bassett, our lead and slide guitar player, yeah. is uh, the, our chief engineer and producer. And we just play. And, and most of Foghat's songs anyway, over the years, a lot of them have come from just jamming. Uh -huh. You know, riffs, tempos, feels. And then, you know, Dave or whoever's the lyricist will come up with some lyrics. Occasionally there will be one song that somebody would uh, have all together but then the rest of the band would get their grubby fingers on it and ruin it. No. Uh, <laughs> no, they're jamming, um, you know, just playing. Yeah, well, that's awesome. And folks, if you're just tuning in, go ahead and feel free to, I'm looking at comments over here. I'm not watching the Andy Griffith show. Uh, feel free no. to chime in in the comments, ask questions. I'll relay no. them to Roger. Let me mute that's myself quiet. here. There we go. Um, it's thirsty work here. Yeah. yeah. Oh, let's see. What... Um, I saw some. Okay, cool. Keep on coming, folks. So what is the deal with, and I'm going to show a picture of him. Talk about how you met Scott Holt and how he became part of the band. The new lead singer, rhythm guitar player. Well, lead and rhythm. He plays everything. Brilliant yeah. guitar player. Uh, <clears throat> about 2014, 2015, <clears throat> a good mutual friend of ours, a photographer, um, introduced us to him. Uh, I think we were in New York and we were, uh, we just hit it off. Um, I invited him down to our studio down in Florida just to hang out. And um, we were working on our last studio album, um, Under the Influence. I remember that. Oh, like uh, a couple of songs. About two, we needed another two or three songs. So uh, Scott and I and Brian Bassett, our lead and side player, it went down to the studio and instead of writing three, we wrote 17. Wow. <laughs> Typical musicians just over. We don't need that many. Well, I'm afraid that's what you've got. So we got... We picked the three that we liked, um, <laughs> and we had all these excess of material. So um, <clears throat> we were um, we were doing a few other things in in Nashville for somebody else, and uh, we decided to have a new band. And I think Brian Bassett, on his second bottle of Cabernet, got up on the board and said, "Earl and the Agitators." So, so that spawned another record. Uh, is that anywhere near here? No. no I don't know. I, uh, here it is. Anyway, Scott Holt was the singer on Earl and the Agitators. He actually sang uh, three songs on our last studio album, um, played guitar on seven or eight of them, and uh, we just became really good friends. Um, our, uh, our lead singer, Charlie Hewn, uh, yeah. called us. Two days before we were supposed to start rehearsals and go on and go on the road, and said that he was retiring, which was kind of a shock. But uh, yeah, it was kind of out of nowhere, right? Uh, yeah, but I mean, I, I, I'm, I mean, I was good with somebody. If you know somebody wants to retire, I think he had some some issues that uh, 
you know, physical issues that we were struggling with. <clears throat> so, uh, but Scott was actually down in the studio. We were writing uh, some, we were just writing songs again. And um, so, <laughs> um, our manager asked Charlie not to say anything for a while because two days before we're supposed to start rehearsals. It was kind of, it was kind of weird actually. Um, <clears throat> but, um, I said to Scott, um, do you, you want to have a go at this? He said, yeah, let me make a phone call first. And I said, all right. He called his wife. <laughs> Says, all right, if I joined Fogcat and she said, please. <laughs> <laughs> I wish Charlie were the best, um, but I haven't, he didn't call me. Uh, he didn't call Brian either. And we've been, in, he's been in the band for like 20 years. It was kind of, it was kind of weird, but uh, I don't know. Um, different folks with different strokes. And I think, I don't think it's ever easy when you have to make a decision that you're not going to play anymore. Um, yeah. I'm, ne I'm never going to say that. I'll put it out in the world that I'm going to live to 105 so I figure I'll stop when I'm 90. Actually, I'll probably stop when the good Lord decides it's time to go. <laughs> well, I was going to ask if you've got plans for the next 50 years yet. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be playing. Um, there's, there's, some, uh, there's some issues like, you know, with playing. I've had a lot of work done on my hands and feet and toes and stuff like that. Um, you know, I've got some really good doctors there's that side of it and you know maybe <clears throat> honey hush one it was one of our songs off the live album which was particularly uh what's the term frantic with yeah. that youth enthusiasm uh we don't we don't play that one at the moment because doing those sort of triplet things with my right foot does hold on a second it's working today <laughs> of course that <laughs> <laughs> uh, Generally, uh, you know, so uh, you know, I, I play both match grip and traditional. Yeah, so, I've noticed that uh, in your solos. Yeah, because you know, when you're playing, this one is like it's a it puts different strains on different joints. Whereas right. this, you know, when you play that, it's um, it's pushing these joints together. It sound like I sound like an old person. I'm not talking like this anymore. <laughs> How old are you now? <clears throat> 76. 76. So if you figure, if you started at 12, you've been playing for about 64 years of banging ah! on stuff. <laughs> yeah. Stuff's going to get affected, man. It, you know? Uh, yeah. Um, I try to take care of myself. I don't drink as much as I ought to anymore. Um, uh, it's um, basically, I love to play. Uh, yeah, I play in a yeah. great band. I love the music. Uh, and especially, um, I don't know, since Scott Holt joined the band, it, it, there's a, a little bit more freedom because I can say, be, he played with Buddy Guy for 10 years. He was Buddy Guy's second guitar player. So mm -hmm. another guy could play. Um, and, uh, you know, I can say to him, or, or Brian, we say, you want to try so and so tonight? And, like, we can do songs that we haven't played in whatever or we'll just sit in a room and work it out and just go out and play it. nice that, that part is kind of refreshing um i remember like you know back in the day in the 70s uh, myself and the bass player craig mcgregor would like go out and jam at local clubs after we'd finished playing or if we had a day off and also lonesome dave and i would also go out and sort of jam in different bars and i think we could do that again now with scott because he's just a oh. lot more, uh, he's only, what is he, 58? 56. Oh, he's a baby. The baby, Gosh, yeah. I'm older than that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he's, um, he's a real blessing and a lot of fun and a great, great guitar player. Um, hey, hey, anybody who plays with Buddy Guy has got to have some chops, right? Yeah, plus he's got a great haircut. Yeah. <laughs> he does have an exceptionally fine haircut and a hairdresser. His hair, actually, I think he cuts his own hair. I have a specialist. His name is Schick. <laughs> <laughs> He's so. I think, I think he knows him. He knows. 
<laughs> Let's talk about some non-musical stuff for a moment. Um, so that people who maybe haven't seen us together before can get to know you a little bit more. Um, there's one thing you and well, there's a lot of things you and I have in common. We'll talk about some of those again. One of them happens to be in common with my wife. Well, that sounds weird. And that is that you know, she's very nice, but we, I'm happily married, you know, you know. I mean, there was a time, maybe a long time ago, we were into that sort of thing, but I don't. Uh, I'm going to go now. We're not getting into this, are we? <laughs> Linda's next, right next to him out of the picture. She's our favorite cornbread baker. Yeah, right. Yeah. Remember. Remember right. that? Right, right, yes. And and another thing we both have in common is what we do to decompress. Roger's an avid fisherman. Living in the mountains here in Arizona, I go fishing at the Rim Lakes at about 8,000 feet, which is just wonderful. Willow yeah. Springs, Bear Lake, and whatnot. But you are also an avid gardener, and that's what keeps me off the news. What are you currently growing? Um, we've got tomatoes, of course. We've got lots of varying peppers, sweet peppers, hot peppers. Um, uh, what else is in there? Um, Eggplant, zucchinis, potatoes, got everything in there. Lots of herbs as well. Uh, the herb garden surfaces every year, despite me not doing anything to it. Actually, yeah. I let it all the all the herbs sort of uh, flower this year. Um, because it, we have, not to get off the subject of drumming, but this is important and important to me. Yeah. Bees yeah. are oh, yeah. the ones. That, without bees, we'd be nothing. So I let everything flower. And, of course, we have had tons of bees in the garden this year. So, but that's it. Yeah, um, no, that's good because then it also, you, you get the that? seeds again and they grow back like weeds because they right, see. Right, that's yeah. right. That's and right. bees are wonderful if you leave them alone. We we have along our driveway, um, a very narrow garden, about 18 inches, but it's about 60 feet long and it's all wildflowers. There's carpenter bees, right. bumblebees, regular bees. Right. I. I get in there and water. They don't bother me whatsoever. No. They leave me alone. I let them do their thing, and we're all good. All right, that, that's exactly right. Um, I have a friend who says, who thinks that bees are wasps, and I've tried very no. hard to explain to her that they're not. They're very, very different creatures. Even though wasps do do in fact to some degree, uh, you know, pollinate. Bees are not. Bees are our best friends, and. Yeah. Uh, they won't hurt you unless you tread on them or sit on them. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Just like drummers. Uh, yeah, yeah, get off. <laughs> and and where's your favorite place to fish? And between Long Island and Florida, if you had one one month fishing excursion, where would it be? Florida between Florida and Long Island. Uh, I don't know really. Uh, I haven't I haven't done I haven't done much fly fishing in recent years for some reason or another. I used to do it out here on Long Island. There's a couple of really fine trout rivers out here. Nice. Nesequa, Nequa, uh, Nesequa and the Kinequa. Uh, beautiful rivers, crystal clear, but they're awfully crowded. Everybody seems to be a fly fisherman these days. Oh, wow. Um, I don't know. Um, my favorite fishing is just walking along the beach or walking along the river, just, you know, fly casting or just casting off the beach. But... I'll also fish just about anywhere there's a, a place where you can wear a line. Yeah. Um, it, it does, it, it, uh, you know, I just chill. Uh, I, fish, I fish off the dock here where I live uh, and catch some bass, uh, striped bass and bluefish. No bluefish yet, um, but I haven't really. I was going to go out today, but I had to talk to you. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> So I'll bring it back to drumming. I've got a very important drumming question, and it's something that yeah. most people probably don't know about you. And I'm going to show a picture of you with Taylor Hawkins playing with you over your uh, yeah. shoulder. Talk to us about that event and about your relationship with Taylor. How much did you know him? And just give us a little bit of history on that, please. Um. We did this uh, show out in the desert, um, and it's actually Taylor Hawkins was instrumental on getting in getting the band on the show. Apparently, he was a Foghat fan, as was Dave Grohl in his day. 
Yeah. And um, we, uh, for some reason, we were booked to do an hour and 15 minutes, but the promoter said, you're only 45, 45 minutes anyway. And uh, and I met him before the show and we talked briefly. And I said, well, want to get up on the end of Slow Ride and just play with me? And he said, no, 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 that's all right. I said, no, come on up. It's, it's cool, you know, just make some noise with me. And he said, no, 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 I don't do that. So uh, we get to Slow Ride where we sort of start, get through the funky part and uh, start playing. And I look at him and he's looking at me and he goes like that. And I threw him one of my drumsticks to catch and he caught it. And I said, I only have one. <laughs> <laughs> so it had to come out. It had to come out, right. Uh, so, um, you know what? That was so sad what happened to him. Uh, yeah. I, I was so looking forward, and we talked briefly afterwards, and I was so looking forward to getting to know the man. I mean, he, um, just this brief time that I met him and, and got a chance to talk to him, he was just this beautiful, bright, outgoing, fantastic drummer as well. I mean, man could play. Yeah. Um, and I was just looking forward to sort of meeting him from time to time on the road, maybe doing it again. Um, yeah. it, was, it was so sad, so tragic. And I, I can't imagine how Dave Grohl uh, got through it. I guess you do what you have to do because I know the two of them are very, very tight. Yeah. yeah it, was a, it was a sad day. It's a real sad day. Well, thanks for sharing that. I'm going to share a question from the comments from one of the viewers. This is, let me make sure I, Joe Sanger. Thanks, Joe, for chiming in. Joe is asking, how has drumming changed over the years from when you started? Um, when I started, when I was 12 or 13, I had, um, uh, it started because I, I, uh, I wanted to get I wanted to get a motorbike. I'd work after school three times a week and I'd work Saturday mornings in a bakery. So I had my own money. We weren't rich, the family, but they were, we never went hungry. Let's put it that way. And I said to my dad, I said, Dad, I, I want to get a motorbike. And he said, well, I'm not helping you with that, son. And I said, well, you had one, uh, you know, but that's different. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, all right, I want to play drums. And he said, ah, um, well, I know a drum teacher. His name was uh, Chris Hewitt. Uh, jazz, uh, he, was, he was a jazz drummer, played with a lot of American artists who came over to England. He lived in uh, southwest London. Where do he live? Uh, uh, near Feltham, somewhere around there. And I used to go there once a week, uh, Saturday afternoons after I'd finished in the bakery. And I went there for um, until I was about 15, I think. I think I stopped going when I, when I started working as a commercial artist. But um, it was interesting. Um, it was the Henry Adler snare drum rudiments book um, mm. that was by, um, what's his name, that drummer? Uh, what's his name? Um, really famous, played faster than anybody else on earth. Was it the one from Buddy? Yes. Yeah, I have that book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Of course. Buddy, the what the one, <laughs> uh, uh, and I, I was pretty. Um, I couldn't always quite get what the practicing was, you know. Like, you know, why has that got to? Because I, I already knew what I wanted. I wanted to play in a blues rock and roll band. That's mm -hmm. that's what I listened to, and and I couldn't quite get what the. Uh, all these things I had to learn had to do with drumming, but uh, I had a breakthrough when I was, when I was about 16, I think this was a year after I stopped taking lessons and I had my drum kit. I've been playing drum, a drum kit for over a year. And all of a sudden I went, Oh, it's, it's, it's not what you do. It's how you do it. You don't go on to, you don't go into a song, go, no, you don't do that. You put this in here. There, oh, there's a hole. And then I, you know, and then I started getting in an understanding composition of songs and stuff like that. Um, I was real fortunate to have a really good drum teacher. I think uh, when I first started, I, I've forgotten everything about reading and most of the stuff I learned there, but I think it stopped me or stops one from having, getting any bad habits and, uh, 
really the way I learned to play was just listening to records. Um, yeah. Really. Um, and making sure my left hand would do what it was supposed to and not say things like, hey, I'm left. <laughs> You're right. Okay. So if you yeah, look we, at how you started with, you know, wanting to play blues and rock and being influenced by a jazz musician who, who was your teacher, and then going on to Savoy Brown, going on to Foghat. Now, all these years later, what do you think are some of the biggest things that have changed in drumming in general? Changed in drumming? In, uh, there's, there's still that sort of the wonder of when you first sort of sit down on a drum kit for the first time and go, wow, you know, that that's i still get i still get that when i sit down on my drums or a drum kit you know it's like you know i i love it but i think um is it new styles that have emerged is it uh, leaps yeah, in was, technology with it, gear you know, what changed i think you know in the especially in like the uh, 60s and 70s there there was a whole you know uh drummers like ginger baker I mean, nobody played songs like Cream did. No, they, people didn't, we didn't play that. That music wasn't out there. Uh, not that I'm a big Led Zeppelin fan, but John Bonham was just absolutely incredible. He's yeah. like, he, he was probably one of the greatest rock and roll drummers that ever came down the pike. Yeah. Um, and, and the way they approached their instrument, and, and both those players like, were influenced by jazz musicians and jazz yeah. music music um and it's so it's basically it's not what you do it's the way that you do it i mean i look the way i approach drumming with uh when we're, you know when we're writing new material and creating you play for the song you listen to the words you listen to the chord changes you listen to the changes you listen to like you know what's going and what's working because I learned a long time ago, there's a lot of different ways to play a song. <laughs> That's true. You know, there is. It's like, no, it doesn't go like that. Well, it does if I put it, if I play it like that, and that's how it's going to go. No. Um, actually, our, uh, Brian, our uh, leading slide player, uh, put it so succinctly for me anyway. He said, playing music is like having a conversation, yeah. you know, it's what it is. You're, you're yeah. talking uh, to each other. Um, unfortunately, um, I'm seriously cheer uh, hearing challenged these days. So uh, probably along with a number of other drummers who have sort of put themselves through the uh, ringer. I thought that 11 was really great. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and there's another drummer who, as we're recording this today on June 29th, 2022, who was heavily influenced by jazz and you could still hear it in his playing all these years later, the birthday boy, Ian Pace today. Oh, fantastic drummer. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, I met Ian a couple of times. Um, the way he played with uh, the band, I mean, it's like, it's incredible. I mean, uh, and he was, he was probably one of the first drummers I ever heard do press roles in a rock and roll song. I'm going, well, how do you manage that? <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I think there's two things that are kind of at two ends of the spectrum when one thinks of how to describe drumming that Ian has finesse, but he's also a really heavy rocker, too. Right, and he's right. put those together in all that Deep Purple music over the years. I was talking to Carmine Apice, uh, oh a few months back. We were hanging out down in Florida and uh, we were, his, Ian, Ian's name came up and uh, he said, Hey, Rog, how do you figure out, because he's a lefty, he plays it all back to front. I'm, I'm listening to him and trying to see what he's doing, and I can't figure it out. I said, no, you can't figure out what Ian Pace is playing. You just have to yeah. sort of go your own way. Do your own Ian's version of it, yeah. yeah. And you Ian's can't watch him and learn unless you're a, le unless no. you're a lefty. I no, can't watch a lefty and learn. It's like, and it's like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Ian, uh, Ian is a brilliant player, in fact. He was, when I first started with Savoy Brown, I mean, he was the one at the time that was like, you know, he wrote the book on how to play great in rock and roll bands. Yeah. And you two, just just came to me, you two have something uniquely in common, other than being great drummers and loving my wife's cornbread, 
And that is, you are both the only original founding members of the two bands you're in. Uh, Ian for well, Deep Purple and you for Foghat. Yeah, that's, um, there was a joke at one time about drummers being the first ones to go and little green globules on the drum seat. <laughs> uh, Ian and Roger, yeah, no, we proved them all wrong. Um, I don't know. It's just a question of like, how fortunate you are. Um, yeah, I mean, we've lost so many. We've lost all the original band members. Um, and it was it was tough. Um, yeah. But I, I've been fortunate over the years. I always played with great players. Uh, there wasn't any one musician that I ever played with, especially bass players, that there were great players. Um, yeah. uh, and I think that's, you know, when we lost, like when we lost um, Lonesome Dave, when he passed, um, I didn't know what to do. I mean, I'd sat around for a while and and I got a lot of uh, CDs and, and cassettes sent to me. But um, there was one, that, the guy that fitted, Charlie Hewn, and it was and it was good. Um, and now uh, Charlie's retired and now we have Scott Hull, um, which is great. New chapter. So, Chapter what? Um, <laughs> Chapter now. I've run out of fingers and toes. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the thing is, it's it's all about the music. Uh, it's all about playing. Um, if I if I didn't think, uh, if I didn't if I wasn't enjoying it and having fun, uh, I wouldn't do it. Um, there again, I'm not that good a fisherman to feed the family. Now, that's another story. Um, <laughs> But uh, no, I'm one of those fortunate few in this world that can earn a decent living. It's something I love doing. And, um, you know, we've, there's, I think there's 12 people in, in Folkat area that we employ every, so it's like, you know, I'm not allowed to retire because yeah. you rely on me to keep playing. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not that. It's not, it's not that. <laughs> You're going back out on the road. That must be brilliant. Yeah, um, playing. Uh, uh, play, playing is great. The traveling sometimes gets you down. It's like hurry up and wait. Um, yeah. You know. You know. You finish playing at eleven o'clock at night. You've got to get up at three in the morning and travel two hundred miles to get on a plane, and then it's hurry up and wait at the airport. That's that stuff. We, the band actually makes sort of light of that. That we get paid for traveling. We yeah. all play. Because yeah. we have a block, yeah. um, but it's this is what you do. It's like, like I said earlier about you know, like the musicians being inherently selfish about their playing. You know, we have to play. It's you don't uh, you don't have a degree of success or joy unless you put everything you got into it. You know, you, you have to give it your best shot. Otherwise, you're not being fair to yourself or your audience. I don't think. Yeah. Are you coming out to the Phoenix area? I haven't looked at your itinerary lately. Do you know if you are? I I hear your managers like real close by. Can I have a glass of wine? <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a white one that's opened up. <laughs> if you guys are coming out to Phoenix, I'd love to connect with you again. Oh, yeah. No, no, no problem. No problem. Um, if we're coming out there, of course, no. You'll, you'll be treated like the prince that you are. Ah, thank you. Thank <laughs> Maybe you. Maybe you'll get up and see him with me on Slow Ride. Yeah, that would be great. Remember, I came out at the Golden Nugget that time on Full for Full from the City. Remember that? Uh, we, uh, I did air guitar for the promotion right, we were doing. Right, right, right. Yeah. right, right. I brought like 50 picks in my pocket. People were <laughs> leaping over each other to get to picks from the guy playing air guitar. <laughs> Brian Stone picks out, no one even notices. <laughs> I'm kidding. No, not that one. <laughs> I'll bring cornbread. I'll make, I'll have Enja make cornbread. Mm. Thanks, Linda. <laughs> That's right. They have their own brand of wine. Talk about that. Where can people get that? <laughs> <laughs> Um, Fogcat.com, um, Fogcatsellers.com. Uh, we have uh, 2013 
Pinot Noir and a 2014 Chardonnay. Both come from uh, central coast of California. Actually, I just talked to our winemaker about a week ago, and we're talking about putting some more. We've been the actually the COVID thing sort of put a damper on everything. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no kidding. Um, <laughs> we're, we're, we're talking about making some new wines uh, this cool. year. Probably won't happen until next year, but um, it's good fun. Um, yeah. I, I love working with the farmers. We've actually sort of picked the grapes a number of times, and um, it's uh, – That's great. Yeah. I still have the bottle. It's empty, but I still have the yeah. bottle of the Chardonnay from uh, when we got together last. You know, you know, some people say, well, no, I'm not going to open it. That's a sin. Of course you should yeah. open the one. I'll send you another one. Uh, of course you should open it. Wine, wine's a living thing. It needs to breathe. It needs to come out of the bottle. I mean, I said this to somebody like, said, well, what, that wine's been in there like for how long? I said, yeah, we have to let it breathe. You'd smell a bit if you were locked up for 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So, uh, the, the wine aficionados are going, oh, God, he's talking about it again like that. <laughs> <laughs> the stuffy wine aficionados. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, so what's on the near horizon for Foghat? Is it for now just getting out and playing a lot during the summer into the fall? Yeah. Um, and then you go we, to finish the next album, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we've got a lot of work in uh, July and August. Um we're playing with a number of other bands, like uh, we're playing with Louis Cole, one of our favourite bands, um, ZZ Top, um, who else? Um, the Dream Police. <laughs> ah, that's right. I saw that advertised. You guys are going to be jamming with, uh, on the same bill as Cheap Trick. Yeah, they're one of my favourite bands. Good yeah. people. Always yeah. a lot of fun hanging out with those guys. They're really – and a great band. They play great. They really do. I enjoy working with them. Actually, I enjoy working with everybody. It's like um, – Especially if we get, you know, we're on a show with another band. If we're on sort of before that, we just did uh, a show with George Thorogood, who we played with a couple of times. Yeah. And, uh, first time we played with George was a couple of years back. And uh, I'm good friends with, with their drummer, of course. And so uh, I get up and grab the maracas and start playing. Nice. And George is up the front and all of a sudden he goes, <laughs> How's that happening? Uh, well, I, I took the other singer's microphone over. <laughs> <laughs> All of a sudden, you got a few maracas. In fact, we just did a show with George, and I, and I we had dinner together, and I, I said to him, I said, I tell everybody I'm the maraca player in George Thorogood and the Destroyers. And he said, you tell everybody that? I said, yeah, because it's true. When I'm here, I play maracas. He said, Okay. <laughs> Uh, uh, George is, uh, is a piece of work. He's, he has a great show and a very, very unique way of playing. He was also telling me that he was a big fan of um, Savoy Brown's original singer, Chris Jordan, because yeah. Chris was in a much lower register, as does George. But uh, the one thing I love about George is the way he actually plays, the way he attacks. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's a fantastic sound. Nobody else plays like that. Yeah, That's he, another. He digs in. Yeah, how do you how do you become unique or special in a world full of hundreds or thousands of people that are doing this or trying to do the same thing? It's like we talked about earlier about drummers. Yeah, like Bonzo changed the landscape. Ian Pace did. Um, Ginger Baker did. You know, they they're, you know they changed it because people went, "Holy shit, what's that?" Um, yeah. Carmine of Peace is one of my favorite drummers. I mean, he just plays brilliantly. He's just like, he's too fucking good. Yeah, he was just on recently again. Was he? Yeah. He is, yeah. So, uh, they we're good friends, actually. We've known yeah. each other for forever, I think. Yeah. Good yeah. man, too. Good man. Yeah, that's great. Well, Roger, thanks so much for taking time to join me again. Can't hear you. Oh. I don't know what happened. I don't know. Let me see. Hello. Check. Hello. How about now? How about now? <laughs> oh, boy. How about now? No? Okay, one sec.
Are we back? Are we back? How about now? Yeah? No? You folks can't hear me? <laughs> you folks can't hear me? What happened? Steve. Steve, did I lose audio? What's going on here? Okay. How about now? Are we back? He's talking to himself. He doesn't know. Microphone. Okay, how about now? Can you guys hear me now? Am I back? <laughs> Unbelievable. Oh, boy. Okay. So I am audible. Can you hear me, Roger? Oh, it's your audio. It's on your end. Go ahead and mute your mic and then unmute. Let me see. So I'm going to mute, ask to unmute. Sorry, folks, we're almost done. <laughs> Just as we were getting ready to say goodbye. You're you're muted. <laughs> uh, sorry, folks. We'll wrap this up in just a sec. Okay. Let me see if I can unmute you real quick. Hold on. <laughs> Okay, well, we might not be able to get, uh, let me text him. We might not be able to get his audio back. He's on mute. Bear with me, folks. Feel free to send in another question. There we go. I'm, I'm texting. Oh, that's not the wireless number. Ah, uh, okay. One sec. Sorry, folks. Uh, one sec. Oh, come on. Okay. How about now? Can you hear me now? <laughs> no. All right, Roger is on mute, and I can't seem to find a way to get him off. Um, one sec. Oh, wow, this, this thing. Okay, there we go. One sec. Thanks for hanging in there, folks. There we go. All right. How about now? Can you hear me now? Okay. So Roger, it's it's your mic. Your mic. You're on mute. <laughs> okay. Hold on, folks. Okay. So I just texted Linda. Um, I'm going to hold up a sign. This is funny. You are on mute. Hey, I moved back. Oh, I still can't hear you. I'm going to check one more thing. How about, there we go. Okay, you're back. Sorry about that, folks. We're playing a game of tag and hide and seek and hula hoop all at once. Can you hear me? Are you able to hear me? Yeah? Yeah, sound great. Okay. <laughs> I was telling everyone we were playing a game of tag and hide and seek and hula hoop at the same time. 
<laughs> so, Roger, thanks so much for coming on again. I'm really excited about your 50th and the blue and the gold Save final. It. I definitely want that. I want to hear what those sound like. So I'm going to get those. We have the link, folks, in the description of the post. If you didn't see that part of the interview of Roger talking about these commemorative 50th anniversary colored vinyls check that out rewind the interview go ahead and listen back they're brilliant it's the old cover it's so cool if you're going to bring vinyl back bring it back in full uh, color right and uh this is the gold one. Oh, cool yeah oh, it's, it's the gold one. Uh, yeah and you got some autograph copies yeah i i look I, at that that is so go. cool it is um and I also write on the back. I wrote sleeve notes. Yeah. Um, here. That because, is so cool. Uh, you know, Todd Brungram played on some stuff, helped mix out some stuff. Um, Dave Edmonds played on a number of tunes as well, played piano and uh, guitar. Uh, my brother, Colin, played piano on Maybelline, Chuck Berry. Everybody has to have a Chuck Berry song. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, especially on their first Don't album. <laughs> cool. You'd be nowhere without Chuck. That's right. Thanks so much for joining us, folks. Thank you for following what we do here on Drum Talk TV and for joining Roger Earl and myself. We'll be back with more fun real soon. Roger, stay on the line with me after we wave goodbye. Goodbye, everybody. Okay. Thanks so much.